In 2 Timothy 2.15 we read, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I really can't overstate the importance of this passage because we must be careful about how we apply God's word. We don't need to be paranoid, but there are some things that just don't fit. And if we truly want to be free by God's word, we need to know how to apply it. And today I'd like to look at a scripture that I have found to be a little troubling. I've meant to do something on it for some time. It is something that is often misquoted. I don't know if you have been affected by it or not, but I have in my life. This would come from Ezekiel 3.18. It is also found in Ezekiel 33.18. And so we want to look at how we should apply it or not apply it. Because that's all that 2 Timothy 2.15 really means. We are correctly applying what it means to rightly divide is just to apply it. And some things don't apply to us today. I mean, the New Test Old Testament to the New Testament is a progression, and we should see it that way. But let's not be too quick to say something doesn't apply. A lot of people do that just so they can get out of their duties as, a, as believers. So we read from Ezekiel 3.18, When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Uh, and this, this also appears in 33.18, as I had mentioned. So it's actually twice in Ezekiel, and actually the placement of these is very important. One is at the beginning of Ezekiel's prophecy to his people, and one is near the end of his prophecy to his people. After that, we start to get into a future prophecy. Uh, and so it's just kind of a very important thing. One of the questions you would ask from this, especially as New Testament Christians, we ought to be asking, how can we be responsible for someone's salvation? Now we are given the great commission by God. We're given it from Jesus. He is telling us to go into the world, or to preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, baptism and the remission of sins, repentance, these things are what we are to preach. And yet when we look at this from Ezekiel, it's very troubling. And I've heard this used, unfortunately, this way. It's been a lot from my experience in, in my life. Those using it are more or less saying that you are responsible for someone's salvation. And I don't think that really lines up with what we see in, uh, in the New Testament scripture. So let's get into some of that right away. First of all, one of the things you have to know is that salvation is of God. We read this in the New Testament. You know, Jesus says that salvation with men is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. That's from the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, you will see I have scriptures listed in the, de in the description at the bottom. I only have Mark 10, 27 for that, but of course it's also in Matthew and, and Luke. But you should be able to reference all of these scriptures at your leisure. We see then, especially from the book of John, it's very clear that the Father has to draw, has to draw the Son, uh, has to draw a person to the Son. So what are we doing here? What is our responsibility? We present the truth. We present the gospel. We see from John 3, 7 and 8, Jesus is talking about being born again. He says that it's like the wind blows. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going to. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. We see in Acts 13, 48, it talks about all of those who were ordained to eternal life believed. Okay. We see it is not of him that willeth or of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy in Romans 9.16. So we keep coming back to this place that even though as believers we have a responsibility to share the gospel, really the salvation is a work that God is doing. We have to remember that. And when you're looking back at this in Ezekiel, I think the single biggest problem comparing the old to the new is that in Ezekiel, you're talking about works. You're talking about a works-based salvation. And uh, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more deeply as we go along. 
You know, for one thing, we see that Jesus died for our sins while we were yet sinners. And the scripture goes on to say, this is from Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. It says, if we then were saved, you know, before we had ever come to him, we were saved through his death. Now we shall be saved through his life. We are told that we have access to this grace by faith. We're not perfect, but we still have access to the forgiveness of sins. So, but when you read this thing in Ezekiel, and especially the way it's used so often, it's like, wow, if you didn't witness to this person, boy, you're going to lose your salvation. Or worse yet, you and the person you haven't witnessed to will both not be saved. That's what it tends to imply. I don't know if you've ever heard it this way or not. But uh, typically, the people using it are very heavy-handed, trying to beat this into you. They will probably also be using Malachi 3, 8 to 10 to try to extort money from you. Uh, nonetheless, we see that in the New Testament, we have Jesus. We have salvation by grace. And we, also, we are also given the Holy Spirit to empower us. These things would not have been in place during the time of Ezekiel. But I'd like to read to you also from, from Hebrews. Hebrews has a lot of good things in it concerning the once-for-all sacrifice for sin that Jesus did. Here I'm going to read from Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 14. Okay. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, that is Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. One offering. And so this is a real problem when we get into this these passages from Ezekiel. You know, how can it be said to us? And what does it mean to say, oh, their blood I will require at your hand? In the New Testament, we aren't doing the saving. We just we just aren't. I mean, we are doing, we are vessels doing the presentation. We are different members of the body of Christ. We don't even have all of the same strengths. Some will be evangelists, but you might not be. I mean, I think we are called to give an account for our salvation to everyone and to witness. But, you know, we're just not all the same. So we look at this. One of the big things is that Ezekiel was talking to Israel. This is not the Great Commission. In the Great Commission, Jesus is, is telling his disciples, he is telling them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay, they start, they start in Jerusalem and they go out from there. But they are to bring the gospel to everyone because now he's including the Gentiles as well as the Jews in the outreach for salvation. Praise the Lord. That's what gives me hope. It probably gives most of you hope also. But Ezekiel was talking to Israel. That was his specific calling. And you can see that in these passages. He is a watchman to the house of Israel. That is who he, is being, he, who he has been called to. Which also ought to tell you that rebuke within the body of Christ is absolutely needed because that's what's going on. Later on, you'll see in places like, I think it's Hosea 1, uh, that they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Even though they are a part of political Israel, they are not all saved to be the spiritual Israel. So that's an important difference between what's happening with Ezekiel and uh, what's happening with the Great Commission. We would have some nagging questions that would arise from the misuse of this, of this verse. How is this blood required of us? Would we lose our salvation? Would it shorten our lives? You know, what, how is this blood going to be required of us? Is the other person not saved because of us? Do, is, it, is it going to be that when Johnny is facing God, that God is telling him, well, well, Johnny, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, I sent Andy to you, but he didn't get the job done. And so I have to condemn you to hell. I mean, don't worry, he'll be there too. But I have to condemn you because Andy didn't do it. Do you really think that God is going to, to ignore someone that has otherwise been ignored, you know, or let's say 
well, not ignored, but let's say we've just kind of passed it over. Boy, we all make mistakes. There have been plenty of times, I'm sure, in your life as well as mine. Boy, I wish I had witnessed to that person. You know, there was more of an open door there and I didn't walk through it. What do we do? We repent. We ask the Lord to forgive us. We revenge disobedience. We ask that we might it might not happen again. And the next time he empowers us and so that it doesn't happen again. So how can we apply Ezekiel 3.18 or 33.18 to say that we are, we are now in danger of being cast into hell, losing our salvation because we blew it once? Or how can we say this other person is going to be cast into hell because we blew it? How about there are other people in the world to bring the message? And God is not limited by his creation. I've said, I've said that often. That's one of those nagging questions. Doesn't God have anyone else that can go and make up what I blew what I, when I blew it? I think he does. And I'll tell you, he doesn't need them. I'm going to get to that even right now. Okay, we see this. We see this as it was in the example, biblical example of Cornelius. Remember the centurion Cornelius, who was praying and an angel visited him and told him to send to Peter so that Peter would come and tell him about Jesus. Guess what? God went right to Cornelius. Cornelius wasn't saved. He wasn't even, you know, of the body. He wasn't even an Israelite. So you see, God is well able to reach out to people on his own. Now, Peter came and followed suit, but he was he was second fiddle, right? God went to Cornelius first. And I have also mentioned at different times the example from Meltari in Indonesia, where when they visited a remote village, they went to finally present the gospel. They hadn't been there because they were so remote. People hadn't gotten there. But when they got there, they found that God had revealed himself to the witch doctor. He had, he had told the witch doctor the story of salvation, the story of creation, the flood, different things. And so they got there and they found a group of Christians in this remote village that never had a Christian missionary go visit them. Do you think God is going to send someone into hell because of our weakness? Because we blew it once? No, that's not going to happen. Sure, share the gospel, praise the Lord. But, uh, God is the one that saves. And as you know, most people won't come to him. You know, what do we get when we read in places like Philippians 3, 12 to 16? It says that we are not perfect, but we put behind us those things that are in the past and we reach forward to what lies ahead. And that is exactly what we do. So I just tell you that these passages from Ezekiel do not apply to Christians today. It just doesn't line up. The things from Ezekiel clearly indicate a works-based salvation. It's saying, you go and tell the wicked, you warn them from their way, and if you don't do this, you're lost and they're lost. That's not what God tells us in the New Testament. So if a preacher is preaching this, please don't listen to him. Pull him aside, tell, let him see this video, tell him some of these, these passages from Scripture. He is definitely taking things out of context. And that's just going to be a burden and not a blessing to the congregation. I hope this has been a blessing to you. This study has been a blessing to me. Have a good day in Christ.